Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine in preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria. Okay. So, the book of Amos. Amos means burden bearer. And this is a, a man who prophesied in the mid 8th century BC, about 760. He was from Judah, from Tekoa, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. But his ministry uh, was to the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, he also was contemporary with Jonah. Of course, Jonah's ministry was to uh, Nineveh, uh, re very reluctantly, and uh, <laughs> the sovereignty of God. We'll talk about that more willing in a couple of weeks. But, uh, but Jonah, Hosea, and Isaiah all were alive and ministering during Amos' life. And so God was sending messengers to Israel and Judah and even the surrounding nations telling them the truth. Now Hosea was and Amos were the only two writing prophets to the northern kingdom. So most of what we read in the prophets is gener maybe generally directed to Israel, both Israel and Judah, uh, but the writing prophets were addressing Judah, Jerusalem. Uh, they had a concern, of course, with the the house of David, uh, because the Messiah would come from, from there. And Jerusalem was that city where the temple was. And, uh, so there was a focus there. So Amos is, is uh, along with Hosea, unique in that they, they addressed Israel. The purpose was to announce and interpret Yahweh's judgment on Israel who had grown to feel secure even in idolatry, immorality, and injustice. And it just occurred to me there that those three words start with the letter I. I guess if you make sermons that way, you can make that little application there. Idolatry, immorality, and injustice. For Israel. For Israel, that's right. But praise God, the I doesn't eternally characterize Israel. Um, themes in this book include judgment. It's, it's the main theme, I would say. Judgment on the nations. Judgment regarding lack of true worship in Israel. Judgment re regarding the lack of justice in Israel. It also includes a call to repentance. Uh, praise God. Uh, and it also gives us teaching about the restoration of Israel in the day of Yahweh. And it's an interesting, we'll, we'll get to it, but it's definitely the idea of a remnant. And we'll think about how does that compare with what Paul said when he said all these people will be saved. And I think they fit together just fine. Uh, the outline can be broken up into three parts. There are nine chapters. Chapters one and two, judgment upon the nations. Then number two, chapters three to six, Israel's guilt and judgment. And in chapters 7 to 9, visions of judgment and restoration. And Amos is an example of one of the prophets. It's very typical to announce the guilt of Israel, the judgment of God against their sin, and then give the promise of restoration, which is not based on their goodness because the rest of the book, the majority of the book is how they are not worthy of his uh, love and mercy, and yet we find out he gives it anyway, which fits with what the message of the Bible is throughout, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. And so, that's the way it is for Israel. God has grace for them, because he is a God who has grace, and, and it honors God and, and not the people who receive the grace. We want to look at some of the some of the verses. There's a <clears throat> there's a lot, 
but we'll just go through and we want to make sure and look at chapter 9. So if we go through here and uh, we get to, to 10 o'clock and we haven't got to chapter 9 yet, please start a minor revolt and get my attention. <laughs> Skip. <clears throat> But the first place I want to look there is in, uh, does anyone have a question about any of that background stuff? I forgot to tell you, Amos uh, gives his calling uh, and he says, I'm, I'm not the prophet or the son of a prophet, uh, but I'm a, a sheep herder and a tender of sycamore fruit. And he says that in chapter 7, 14. And, uh, that's been summarized by some scholarly people as being a fig picker. He was a fig picker, so a sheep reader and a fig picker. That, that sticks in my mind, Amos the fig picker. But what this shows is that the message is not within the prophet, doesn't come from the prophet himself. Um, it's not that we find some guy who's smart or who, some guy who can put thoughts together well. What we need to hear, we need to hear from somebody who will tell us what God says. And that's what Amos did. And that was his point. Well, um, it says he delivers a series of messages from God, but how does he do that? Does he just walk through the countryside? Or? <laughs> you know, there's, we're told that he's serving during the days of Jeroboam. And the fact that he brings attention to, I'm not a prophet of the son of the prophet. Uh, it makes me think that likely he addressed the king or the leaders. Um, it's I I don't know is the answer so to that. Help. We have his written we have his written prophecy, but there's there's not much narrative in here about uh, you know what he did, how he did it. We we do know that he got the the message across. And it's preserved here, uh, and was considered important to preserve historically, uh, because this is one of the books uh, in the canon of Scripture from the time before Jesus was born. So uh, that's a good that's a good question. How how exactly did did that happen? Uh, I think he probably simply addressed. The leaders in in some appropriate or adequate way, some way that worked. I don't know if that meant he waited outside until Jeroboam came out and then he addressed him. You know, I'm not sure. That seems to be John the Baptist just preached and drew a crowd, um, and that maybe is not as far fetched as a way to spread a message. If you remember that they didn't have any way to communicate except the painstaking writing or oration. You know, can call anybody, can get online, yes. do any of that. So, so I know that public speaking was a, uh, a much bigger and more widely appreciated event in the ancient world than it is now. Uh, I would say most of the time if somebody walks into a park or whatever and there's somebody standing up on a platform talking first thing is probably suspicion or you know what is this I think back in those days the first thing would happen is well I probably need to hear this what's this guy saying mm -hmm. so King sent heralds and that's the way it, that's the way it happened so even now well when we've been through New Orleans and stuff that there's lots of people just standing in corners yeah. just preaching the gospel right and whomever will stop and listen right okay so in chapter 1, verse 1, Yahweh roars from Zion. That's, that's the first written words. Those are the first written words of the book of Amos, of, of his prophecy. And I like it. Verse 2 just says, and he said, Yahweh roars from Zion. Amen. Now, think about the northern kingdom, the way it had been set up. Um, Jeroboam had an opportunity to be blessed by God. Jeroboam the first. This is a different Jeroboam that was on the throne when Amos. This is Jeroboam the second during Amos's life. 
Jeroboam the, fo the first had had an opportunity to receive blessing from God and God to to be with him in his in his reign, uh, but he rejected that and uh, went his own way. And as a matter of fact, he set up worship centers in the north and the south of the northern kingdom out of political motivation. He didn't want his people going down to Jerusalem because he felt like that uh, their heart would be then for the the descendant of David on the throne there. And so he set up worship centers in Dan and uh, Beersheba. Yeah, or is, yeah. And that did not please God. As a matter of fact, Amos shows up into that setting and says, Yahweh roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. That's the next part. So that's a <clears throat> that is a prophecy and a judgment against what they were doing, trying to worship God their own way. You know, so you can read about that uh, back in uh, Second Kings, I believe, is, is where we find that. So it's a bad situation that Amos goes to, and he starts with Yahweh roars from Zion. Now look over in chapter two. Uh, you got judgments on the nations, uh, most mostly those right around uh, Israel there. There's also in chapter 2 judgment on Judah and judgment on Israel. Uh, in verses 9 to 12 of chapter 2, God asked some questions. Was it not I who destroy, destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars? He was as strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt, and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your sons as prophets, and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says Yahweh? Now verse 12, uh, he, he turns it on them, said, That's what I've done. I've delivered you. And I provided for you to connect you to me through hearing my word. But what did you do? Verse 12. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets saying, do not prophesy. So God said, I, I pursued purity among you and some people specially called, uh, called out to be leaders among you. And you corrupted them. And I sent my messengers, the prophets, to you to tell you what I say. And you said, don't do it. We don't want it. So that's an indictment. And see the contrast, what God says he did. And what then he says, here's what you did. So they're not working to glorify God in the things that he had done for them. They were working to glorify themselves and what they preferred chapter 3 and verse 2. This is a very helpful verse in understanding what the concept of foreknowledge is. Because the concept of knowing, it's not just in English that we need to understand it, or Greek, but also Hebrew to understand what would it mean. Uh, because there's an implication here People who want to get away from saying that God, that foreknowledge means that God has set His love on, on His people from before time began, they need to make this simply awareness that He became aware prior, uh, similar to what a, a fortune teller would do. Some means of seeing the future and learning about it. Uh, and so that's how people who don't want the... the the implications of God's predestination and election, they try to say, well, it's according to foreknowledge. So he looked through the quarters of time and he knew who would believe in him and so he elected them to salvation. I would say that that is the consensus effort to get away from God being sovereign in salvation. And I, I know that because I was... I was on that team for a while, uh, trying to find a way. And but here's the thing: if you just pursue some truth, what 
when God knows and these words, what does that mean? Look what it says. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Okay. Now, does that mean that God was unaware of all the other peoples of the earth? It doesn't mean that, does it? So we can throw out in this this family of words, and we won't get into it, but Hebrew and Greek, uh, it's the reason that the Bible says, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, you know, she brought forth a child. This word know is much more than just a mental awareness. And so this is one of the verses that help us to see that. I don't know any actual Bible-believing Christian that would say the only... God thought the world was populated by one nation, Israel. He, he didn't know about the others. That's ridiculous since he's just addressed them in the previous chapter. So that's not what the word means. The word know here includes a relationship that he has, that he's established with them. And so when we have foreknowledge, that means that he had a relationship with the people before they even came into a physical existence because he knew them. It's like he told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. My version says, I have chosen you. Yeah. Rather than knowing you. That's a good that's a good way to understand what happened. Um, uh, but but that word know and what's involved in that um, helps us to close the door on one of those objections. So but look at what it says next. That's a great thing, right? To be known of God. Um, and for us to say, praise God, He knows us. Well, here's His reasoning. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And he's saying, you don't have any excuse. <laughs> you, you know better. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, the writer of Hebrews says that He, he chastens His own. He, he disciplines His own. So the, the scariest thing would be if God keeps has nothing to do with it. Leaves If He leaves you in your sin during this life, that means the only thing left is the wrath of God in eternity. So praise God for His discipline uh, and His chastening because that shows that He loves us. So He loved Israel. He knew them. He punished them for their iniquities. He, this is one of the reasons that I'm so uh, convinced of the restoration of Israel as a, as a yet future thing because He's not going to let the people that have carried His name throughout history, <laughs> their final chapter is not, uh, they just didn't have any interest in God. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be it. It's going to be, as he says over and over and over and over and over, then you will know that I am Yahweh, your God. Amen. I will be your God and you will be my people. So, Amen. he just won't do it. <clears throat> Verse 3, and two walk together unless they are agreed. That's one that's quoted a lot. But look at the context. Uh, if God has foreknown you and known you and taken you to himself, there's either going to be strife in that walking together or there needs to be agreement, right? The reason there's chastening and discipline is when we're not, we're not staying in step. So God wants us to be agreed and He doesn't negotiate. <laughs> it's just he, he, He's true. He is truth. And we yield and submit to Him. So, so I've heard that quoted a lot of times. And of course there's a practical truth to it and an application you know we need to work this out or whatever but God doesn't work things out with the way he works things out with Israel is he brings them ultimately to a place of repentance and regeneration ultimately verse 6 <clears throat> Amos teaching the sovereignty of God and, and maybe we can say the providence of God if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not Yahweh have done it? <coughs> now, this doesn't mean that there aren't secondary agents and causes. Uh, when terrorists do bad things, that's because terrorists are doing bad things. 
However, ultimately, there's not a terrorist that is autonomous from what God permits and allows. It's just that He redeems the worst things to accomplish His purposes. And He's already planning to do that before they even originate in the, in the, as an idea in a human mind. What do you think the worst, well, the best example of the worst crime against God and life being redeemed for something good is? What would you say that would be? Jesus. Absolutely. The, the only one, the only human to walk this earth who was perfect according to the highest possible standard in every thought, every word, every deed, and his own received him not. And, uh, well, let, let's just, let's make sure we, we understand this biblical interpretation of, of what happened there. That was a calamity. Was it Yahweh who did it? Look at the, the early church prayer. Acts chapter 4, verses uh, 27. 28. They raised their voice to God with one accord and said in verse 24, they're praying. This is after Peter and John have been uh, have come back to them. That's the you know, after they uh, were arrested, this is the after they said, You tell us whether it's right to do what to obey God or man. Uh, they they're released. They get back to the rest of them and they pray. And in their prayer they say this in verse 27. Truly against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now those were, those were choices that those people made to Herod and Pilate and all of them. And yet they did what would, had already been determined to be done. And that's a great mystery that God does that. And, and, and I think of it this way. I could understand it. I could rationalize it if what the Bible taught was, um, look, God can't know the future. Everybody's decisions are their own. And He's just doing the best He can to stay ahead of us. And you know, He's just working to, to, to try to redeem this thing the best He can. But He doesn't know the future. That makes sense to me. I can, I can follow that. But that's not what the Bible teaches. On the other hand, I can make sense of God has basically programmed you to play out. You're a program that's just going to completion. You don't make any real choices. None of that is really yours. You do everything you do just because God predetermined that and it's just a fatalistic, you're just playing out the string. There's no real morality Involved. This is just the play that God has written and we're playing our parts. That makes sense to me. I can understand that, but that's not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is that you make decisions that you want to make and that God governs that in some way and brings every decision of every person, every uh, action of every molecule in the universe actually, and it, he's bringing it to a point where it accomplishes everything, all of his purposes in history. Now that's beyond my ability to understand. I don't know how that works. I just know that that's what the Bible teaches. So that's who God is. 10 o'clock and time to go to chapter 9. But give me 30 seconds in chapter 5. We've got to, yep. I will avoid a revolt. But we've got to see this. In chapter 5, there, there are some calls here, uh, like chapter uh, 4, verse 12, the last part, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Uh, chapter 5, verse 4, that says Yahweh to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Verse 6, seek Yahweh and live. Mm -hmm. This is what he's saying to the people who have sinned against him. 14 and 15 in chapter 5. Seek good and not evil that you may live. Seek Yahweh, God of hosts, so that Yahweh, God of hosts, will be with you. Uh, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that Yahweh, God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And, and, and it is true. 
Verse 18. This is for the people who feel good and in, in they're that they're a good person, that they do good deeds according to their own judgment. Verse 18, Woe to you who desire the day of Yahweh. What good is the day of Yahweh to you? It will be darkness and not light. Verses 21 to 24, Empty religion. This means if we're here today just to check a box or say, I'm a good person, I go to church, here's what God thinks about that. This is what He said to them, I hate, I despise your feast days. By the way, he himself had appointed them, and they were observing them, and he said, I hate it. Why? Well, he says, I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments, but let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Uh, so we see that that verse there at the end is actually not just about civil rights. It's about justice, but it's about God's justice to the people who are going to meetings to worship in. But their hearts are not in it, like Isaiah said. Your, your lips declare it, but your hearts are not for me. And the command is love the Lord your God with all your heart. Not have perfect attendance. Your attendance at meetings like this is a way to show that you love God with all your heart. Can't skip the heart part, though. Chapter 6, verse 1, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Look at verse 8. Yahweh God, uh, the Lord Yahweh has sworn by Himself. The Lord Yahweh of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. I will deliver up the city and all that's in it. And He did it. Verse 14, I will raise up a nation against you. And He did it. Um... He measures them. Now, now let's go. Let's go to chapter nine. The destruction of Israel in the first part. He's serious about this. In the middle of verse one, he says, "I will slay the last of them with the sword." Now he's talking about sinners in Israel. Where can you go to hide? Verse two. Though they dig into. Hades or hell, Sheol, the grave, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. Verse 4, terrifying. The end of verse, the, the end of verse 4 says, I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. And I just want to tell you something. If the God of the universe who spoke the universe into existence purposes in his heart against you personally, I'm going to bring harm against you. You have never contemplated harm the like he can do and he will in the lake of fire that is not a good place to be that's why the writer of Hebrew says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God uh, we don't need to miss this part in our evangelism and our preaching of the gospel our, our society is so uh, bent on how do I feel what do I like? What do I think justice is? Uh, they need to hear the God of the universe has decided this against sinners. He's going to bring harm and not good. Harm and not good. Now let's look at uh, verses, uh, verses 8 to 10. Let's think about who's going to be saved. <clears throat> Listen for the idea of a remnant here. Starting verse 8. Let's we'll start in verse 8. Behold, the eyes of uh, the Lord Yahweh are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says Yahweh. Okay, now there's a remnant, right? Mm He's -hmm. going to destroy it, but not utterly, not completely. Echoing what we hear from Romans 9 through 11. Look what he says. Surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. In other words, he's going to be very meticulous in his judgment of them, uh, in, in who they are and who he is. Then verse 10, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. Romans 9, 6 uh, talks about the sinners among the people. And 
there Paul is answering the question that's important. So if God is sovereign and in control and loves and saves, what about unbelieving Israel? That's the question he answers in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Uh, and in verse 6 of chapter 9, he says, it's not, it's, it's not that the word of God has taken no effect, mm -hmm. for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. And what he means here is that some of them are sinners, and they don't love God with all their hearts. They don't belong to him, even though they are the physical descendants of Israel. And they say, the calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. And that's what the religious leaders of Jesus' day said to him, remember? When he was telling them and pressing them, but what about your heart? What about your sin? Your, who are you? They, their, their card was, we're the children of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Well, God can raise up children of Abraham from stones. <laughs> the problem is, yeah, but you're a sinner. And then he says, you're of your father, the devil. Spiritually speaking. Now look here what happens. Uh, and and this, is, this is awesome. Well, before we, before we do that, we see that all the sinners will die by the sword. We see, I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. And in uh, Romans 11, there's the idea, what does it mean when it says... Romans 11, 26. So all Israel will be saved. So how is it that all Israel will be saved, but this is saying I'm going to destroy, but not utterly, and all the sinners will die? Well, it's that when that process is over, mm -hmm. then those who are at that moment truly Israel are the ones who survive. They survive. Zechariah talks about in the in the siege against Jerusalem on the day of the Lord, uh, many will die. Many will die. But there are those who will not die, and that group are the elect, the one that God has known, the ones that God has known throughout, and that group survives, and all of them are saved. And it's right for Him to say, "All Israel is saved," uh, because. Romans 9, 6, not all of them are Israel who are of Israel. So, so some, some of them, the majority of them, even in that day, get the judgment of God, but he does not utterly destroy Jacob, and he considers those who survive, this is all Israel, this is Israel. And he saves them. They look on him whom they pierced, and they mourn, uh, and it says the deliverer comes from Zion and banishes uh, sin from Jacob. He banishes all unrighteousness from Jacob. And he does that through the circumcision of the heart, through the regeneration that is applied to Israel now uh, in the new covenant. And so that's what, that's what he's talking about. Now praise, praise God for this. Here's what the end of it says. And if uh, for, for those of us who might be Gentiles in here... <laughs> he says on that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages and by the way this is quoted in Acts uh, 15 and repair its damages raise up, raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom mm -hmm. that's amazing there are some Edomites descendants of Esau saved, <coughs> and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. There's that word called again. All the Gentiles who are called by my name. Says Yahweh who does this thing. Uh, so, the and Paul says the same thing, the restoration of the tabernacle of David, or Israel, is a blessing to the rest of the world. So that Others are saved by grace. And remember he said that, that he's, he's sent the Messiah not only to uh, redeem and restore Jacob, but also to be a light to the nations that his salvation might extend to the end of the earth. Uh, now, look what he says though specifically in 14 and 15. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. 
They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says Yahweh your God. Uh, and, and that's preface in 13, the days are coming. Now, if that, either, either he's going to do that or not do that. See the I wills there? I will plant them. I, I don't believe we're helping ourselves to try to apply some type of theological grid that redefines these things as uh, the raising up of the tabernacle of David so the Gentiles can be saved and just make all that mean the church because it's nonsense to say it. I will raise up the church so that the church can also be saved. Mm -hmm. So that if you make Israel the church, then you've got, you do away with the two groups that are here. I'm going to raise up the tabernacle and that's how the Gentiles are going to be saved. As a matter of fact, Jesus, the son of David, came... He hasn't been recognized by Israel uh, yet, but God is, the book of Acts shows, okay, you're not going to receive him. Paul's last word to them is, I'm going to turn to the Gentiles, they'll receive him. And we are. And there's a time that the fullness of the Gentiles ends, and then this happens. Amen. And that's, that's Romans 9 to 11, understood that way, fits perfectly with what Amos says. So, praise God for that. Any questions? <laughs> that that I will agree to take right now. <laughs> <laughs> About something easy to answer. Any comments? All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll dismiss there. This it's a great book. This is another one of those rather short prophetic books that just start with Yahweh roaring. In judgment and against Israel and ending with I will plant them in the land. Amen. So praise God for his grace. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Thank you for this this book. Um, gives us a, a look at what you say in those in those days, what you said to them about what they were doing. Lord, you care what we're doing now. Yes. But you've also announced what you're going to do uh, to bring history to your planned end for it. And we praise you as the source, sustainer, and end of all things. We love you, Lord. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.